Today we are in, let's see, are we still going here? Okay, yes. Um, today we are in um, the book of James, chapter uh, 2. We'll start out in verse 5. We may, um, And so we're talking about blessed are the poor in spirit. Now this, this is from Matthew, from the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus stood on the Mount and, and talked about um, just a very theological message. And um, James, the author of the book of James, picks up on this concept that the poor are blessed. And so I want to spend some time today talking about that concept and uh, see how far we get with that. So blessed are the poor. Is that not a little bit contradictory? Who here wants to be poor? Who would like to lose some income uh, so that they can have that blessing? You know, when you put that way, there's almost nobody. Um, would you like to be poor in order to be, I mean, you know, I mean, let me, let me pose it as a really hard question. I don't really expect anybody to answer it. But knowing that you will be more blessed in your spiritual life, knowing that you would be closer to God, how much, how much of your financial security is that worth? That's a hard question, isn't it? That's sticking it to you. I, I, nobody has to answer that. But I want, you to, I want us to process this. I want us to think, what was Jesus talking about? What is James talking about? Now, we know in the big picture, as we move into chapter 2, you know, James is saying, he, he, he is saying uh, one example of living your life for Christ uh, is the way you treat people. And if you show favoritism to wealthy people, see, and I don't know if we do it too much today, but in, in the first century, theologically, one of the things that the Bible is doing, now this is a big picture of the Bible, it is trying to transition ancient theology, the, the theology, the way people thought about the gods before the Bible was that if you are wealthy, you are blessed by God, that God, the gods, God, the gods are in control and they, if they give you money, they like you better than people that are poor. And that's called retribution theology. That if you are wealthy, God likes you better than the poor person. The Bible says no. You know, and that's the very important. The book of Job uh, in the Old Testament breaks retribution theology. It breaks the back of it. If you want to have a retribution, a clear retribution theology, then you've got to get Job out of your Bible. Because Job is wealthy and he is righteous. And God allows everything to be taken from him. Even though God loves him, God allows everything to be taken. And he suffered. Job suffered. Now, so the, so the big picture of the Bible is breaking that. Well, Jesus ta takes it a step further when he says, blessed are the poor. And James, Jesus' half-brother, is picking up on that idea. And you understand that's upside-down thinking to most people. Blessed are the poor. So let's look in the scripture and try to follow along, starting in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 5. James says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who loved him? What do you think that that is saying? Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Why would that be? Well, if you have nothing and you are a person of faith, then you have to rely on God. You are hand, when you are hand to mouth, and you're a person of faith, you rely on God to give you. Now, I, you know, when we were 
out in the desert, in the California desert. And, you know, we went to California in 2004 uh, with a one-year-old Ellie and a promise of $600 a month as our income. And we spent a lot of time with, you know, bills would be coming in. We'd have $200 in checking and $250 in, in savings. And that was all we owned mm -hmm. in the world. We had, you know, we had cars. Um, we had a vehicle or two generally. And we'd get that check and, you know, we would pay stuff off. And I realized a long time ago, I... I just prayed to God. I was like, God, you gotta help me. You gotta help me. I, God, give me, let me, you know, find a, a a second job that allows me to be a preacher out here in the desert. But I can also, you know, make ends meet. I'm a daddy. I'm a husband and a daddy. And what I realized, and what I realized, and and y'all can look at me. I don't think I have ever in 57 and a half years missed a meal uh, because of poverty. You know, and I, I never did. But nevertheless, I was not pleased to be so close financially and to not have nothing. And what I realized about my faith was that what I wanted in order to have faith and what I wanted to really put my faith in was a statement from the bank that they would send me each month and on it, it had a nice big number. Now, how much is it possible that, let's say I got a piece of paper in the mail that said $50,000 on it in your bank account. How substantial, how solid is that number? Is it possible, has there ever been cases where people had a number at the bank and then all of a sudden that money was gone? I mean, we know the Great Depression. People had money. And then all of a sudden that money disappeared. And so we live in a world and we believe as people of faith, we look out the wind and we see those trees. Who, who made those trees? God. Who made this table? God. Who made each of us and designed us? God. But I, that wasn't enough for me. In order to have faith in God, I wanted God to change that number. You know, and now that was back when I was, you know, when we were in California, you'd get a bank statement. Now, I don't even get a bank statement anymore. I told them to quit and I just look on the computer and there's a number on the computer. Is it possible that number on the computer, I could look there and see a number and then the next day it not be there? Well, sure, the internet could go out. The internet could absolutely shut down all of a sudden. You know, if we go to war now, that the first thing that's going to happen is the internet's going to go off. You know, and everything we do on the internet, that's just going to disappear all of a sudden. That's going to be gone. And don't you know uh, that they're going to be targeting bank statements and making money disappear? Why? Because that'll, that'll breed confusion. But still, I wanted to have faith in a number rather than trust God. Now, my case that I'm trying to make is that God, everything I ate, God created and gave to me. Every single calorie God created the sunshine, you know, the sunshine comes down, photosynthesis makes the, the leaves green and the grass green and the animals eat it. And then, then we eat plants and animals and that's how we live. And it all comes from God. And I have always eaten too much. My problem has always been to eat less, not to have enough to eat, never. But I could not trust God who provides me with every morsel in my mouth. I wanted to trust the people at the bank and they send me a number there that says you are okay. And I think that's what this is getting at. Blessed are the poor 
because they don't have nothing else but God to trust. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Because they have nothing else. They have to trust God. The poor that are faithful. Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God? That is, the people who are rich in faith, the people who trust God, have surrendered their life to God, will inherit the kingdom, the kingdom of God, God's ultimate plan. God's permanent plan is his kingdom, and people that have Jesus in their heart and faith and trust God will, be, will inherit that kingdom, will be a part of that kingdom. He promised to those who love him, the the ones who will inherit the kingdom that God promised to those who love him. Now, Jesus had this same thing. We've already, we looked at it in the opening slide. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, not all the versions have the in spirit part, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is, that's what James, this statement that Jesus had made, I'm trying to think, I doubt there was a widely circulated, it is possible that James had a scroll being there in Jerusalem with the writings of Matthew on it. It is possible, but it's unlikely. Most likely, James know, was there at the Sermon on the Mount or knows people that were, and this is a famous quote of Jesus. I, I feel like he is talking, repeating what Jesus had said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, the people who don't think they're okay spiritually. And that changes it a little bit. That's not just financial. But there, are the, some of the other versions just say poor. There's enough. And we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures about the poor uh, to try to develop, kind of try to triangulate what we think about this. Uh, but definitely... Why, well, let me just ask this question. Why do we like money? Is there anybody here that does dislike money? Now, we, money is aggravating, and there's never enough, and, you know, it's, it's bum-fuzzling, and it causes people to fight. But is there anybody here that wouldn't like a little bit more money than you got? Nobody? Uh, why? Why do you like money? Pay your bills. To pay the bills. Okay, well, you have enough to pay bills. You said you wanted more. Are you are you delinquent on bills? I get delinquent every now and then. I forget to pay bills every now and then. But, <laughs> but, but if you've got enough, why would you want more? Well, I, you know, I used to tell my students, I said, you think you want money. You don't really want money. What you want is choices. What we want is choices. We want to be able to choose where we live. We want to be able to afford to live there. We want to be able to, to have a car that works and fix it when it doesn't and, you know, have the car that we like. We want choices and we don't really want money. We want choices. And I, I would, the reason I would tell my students that is I would say in America, you get a free public education and through education, you can achieve choice. You can get choices through education. Doesn't matter who you are. If you will work hard in school, you can progress up and then you can make yourself um, a person that people desire to have work for them or whatever, and you will have choices. Vice versa, if you don't do well in school, it's going to limit where you live. It's going to limit the jobs you can get. It's going to limit your potential. And that's why I would tell them that we want choices. But you know, ultimately, why I think we like money because money has value to us. Worth. The word worth. You know, the word worship, we are supposed to worship God. And you know, the word worship in, in Middle English, when we got that word, is worth shop. And that means the value of something. When you worship God, it's not an action, it is giving God value. And so, Money represents value, worth. Sin has separated us from God, and everything we do, everything that sin does, twists the fact that we were created to give God value. And so, 
sin separates us from God. We're divorced from God, if you will, by sin. And so we find something else that is valuable to pour. We were created to give God value. And if God is far away, then we give money value. It's the most natural thing. And that's why money is important to us. Now, what happens if a person doesn't have money? Then they have to pour their value in something else. And that opens us up to faith. Ultimately, we are blind because of sin and we are searching for something. And when we find God, we begin to realize that's what I was missing. That's what I was missing. So blessed is a person that doesn't have something artificial like money that is really come and go. You have some and then it's gone. But God, who is eternal, is what we are looking for when we, when we think about money. In Luke, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said this. Blessed are you who are poor. Now, he didn't say poor in spirit in Luke, in the Luke version. He just said, blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. <clears throat> For you shall be satisfied. Now that goes all the way back to Genesis. What is the main uh, metaphor for sin um, and for our emptiness with God? It's hunger. What is the first sin? It's eating the fruit. When when um, Esau went to went in and I, uh, Jacob was making the bowl of stew, what he traded his birthright, and our birthright is interaction with God, and we trade our birthright for sin. And so it's a metaphor. Uh, when he goes, when Esau goes into Jacob, and Jacob is going to make a bad deal with, with Esau and give him the blessing, when God has told uh, Rachel that, let's see, did I get it? I always get Rebecca and Rachel confused in my mind. Anyway, whichever was the wife of Isaac, uh, said, um, before we make this bad deal, go make me a bowl of stew. Blessed are those who hunger, for they shall be satisfied. They will turn to God, and God is what they're actually hunger for. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh as you find God. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you, that means shut you out, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil for the sake of me. All right, that's a big, you know, that's an important verse there, but that's hard. You think about being young people. Young people do not want to be hated. None of us do. They do not, they especially don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be shut out. They just panic them. Insulted, scorned for the sake of me. He says, blessed are you. Because we try to get all those things as a replacement for God. As I said, I wanted not to have to trust God month to month that I was going to have enough to eat and enough to provide for my family. I wanted a, the bank to send me a number and said, okay, Rex, you're okay. Because see that number? Then I didn't have to trust God. Blessed is the one who doesn't have the number on the piece of paper because they are forced to trust God. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets, people treat Jesus' followers, is what he's going for there. So James, back to James, he picks up, we are to have compassion for all people. We cannot favor the wealthy, uh, we can't favor the poor. There are, there are verses in the Bible that says, do not, if you go to court, do not favor the poor people. You know, be just, be just. So compassion for all, James chapter two, verse six. Rather, you dishonor the poor when you show favoritism. Blessed are the poor, but when you pick the rich, you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? 
we tend to defer to important people. I mean, you know, and we Christians are no different. We we see people as important in the same way that that anybody does. Um, if a movie star walked in and sit down at Bible study right here, we would all be amazed and impressed. Why? Because that person gets a lot of attention from other people. Um, but he's saying it's a false. The status given in this world is false. Uh, and we should honor everyone as a creation of God. Um, I remember one time, I don't know why it stuck in my head, we were talking about racism one time, and I said, and I asked you, Dot, I said, Dot, why is racism bad? Do you remember what you said? Mm -hmm. You said, because God created all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the right answer. When you, when you dishonor the poor, when you honor people for earthly status, or look down on other people, uh, you are forgetting that the Creator, Creator God, created us all the same, created us all equal. James points out the inverted nature, the upside-down nature of favoring rich people in church. In general, he's saying, the poor exhibit more kindness um, and less arrogance. He's making that insinuation. So going on to verse 7, don't Slander. Now, I, uh, the word there translated slander is blasphemousin. Blasphemousin. We get the word blaspheming there. Don't they slander or blaspheme Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Um, and again, there they're referring to the rich. You favor the rich. Uh, in arrogance, they are. They can be, I mean, you know, everybody is guilty of, of some blaspheming and turning their back on Jesus, but they're saying the rich have less need for Jesus. So several scriptures on wealth. I just think, again, so we can kind of triangulate and get a Bible, a <laughs> biblical perspective on this topic. Paul in his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in money. That's what I was saying. I wanted to trust in money and not in God, which is so unreliable. And that's the truth. That is the truth. You know, um, I can't remember. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a statistic. I've forgotten what the actual numbers are, but they say that like. 75% of NFL football players, millionaires, end up in bankruptcy because money is unreliable. In the human nature, we begin to relax when we feel like we're okay and we develop habits that are unsustainable. Money is unreliable, so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need to enjoy. And what he's saying there is, you know, God gives us everything and he gives it there for us to have joy in. Enjoy means to be contented in. Give us this day our daily bread. Be content, uh, you know, with what you have. That doesn't mean you can't try to, you know, to, to get a better job or, or, or things like that, but it's just saying, Try to find contentment in what God has given you today. Uh, trust in God who gives us richly what we need to enjoy. Tell them, this is the rich, to use their money to do good and be rich in good works um, because of your faith and the outpouring of your faith. Generous to those in need, always ready to share with others. By doing this, the wealthy will be storing up treasure, up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life, that is, eternal life. Storing up treasure in heaven. 
thought that was a good verse. In Revelation, Jesus is writing his letters to the seven churches. Uh, he writes his letter to the Laodiceans. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, don't you know you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Now, these are Jesus talking to this church, a church that is wealthy and relying on their wealth. I have need of nothing. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. All right, refined in the fire means through hardship. Uh, true value that comes only through hardship that you may be truly rich. And white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. That is, these garments of glow. Uh, uh, this white garments are garments purified by Christ, are sins forgiven, because, you know, if you do not take care of those sins, they follow you for eternity. If they are not taken away, they follow you. And sooner or later, your nakedness, your sinfulness will be revealed. And anoint your eyes with salve that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. So he's saying, I'm, I'm telling you this, church, to hold up a mirror to you so that you can begin to value the things that are valuable, the spiritual things, the faithful things. Thus, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you will open the door, I will come in. In Luke 16, verses 9 through 12, Here's the lesson. These are the words of Jesus. Here's a lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, you they will welcome you to an eternal home. So when you use your money, uh, when you use your resources uh, to benefit others, then you are laying up an eternal resource. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? One of the things about the Christian faith is that we are playing the long game. We are playing the eternal game. We are to live each day in view of our eternity. And so trying to pinch every penny, trying to gain constant advantage, financial advantage, detracts us from the spiritual things that are eternal. And they drag us down. They are weights. Money is can be a weight that holds us down uh, earthbound and not heaven bound. Um, one of the things I like, I think, I, you know, there's many interesting things about Buddhism, uh, their philosophies. Now, you can't get to God through Buddhism, but they do a good job of observing life. And really, to me, Buddhism does a good job of defining sin. And they talk about sin as longing and desire. And what... You know, the goal of a Buddhist is to be reincarnated and get higher and higher spiritually until eventually you can just drift away and you can let go of everything on earth. But they talk about that we hold on to things here on earth and they prevent us from progressing. That in the end, you've got to let go of earth and the things here that are valuable um, in order to go into nirvana. Now, there's a, 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 a inherent contradiction in Buddhism uh, because the very act of trying to let go and, and not have desire, desiring to not have desire is a contradiction. And you know, you are achieving, they, they are teaching that you achieve your goals inwardly. Uh, and of course, it, they are 
you know, they are not, they don't believe um, that there's a creator God and, and, and all those things. But I have always found that interesting. They believe that we're kind of ha hanging on the things that keep bringing us back and dragging us back, dragging us back and keeping us out of nirvana is our longings. Um, uh, and that's what this is saying, you know, that kind of concept is we we fight and fight for every little penny and we give it value and that every little penny is is holding us back from God. It's distracting us from God. If you are untrustworthy trustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? If you are so concerned about financial things, you are not concerned enough about God who created you and, and Jesus who saved you. That is another way to look at that. Now going on, it says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the others. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. One is going to be more valuable than the other. And if things are more valuable, anything is more valuable than God, then that is going to keep you from salvation. The Pharisees, who dearly love their money, heard all this and scoffed at Jesus. Then he said, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors, the priorities of this world is detestable in the sight of God. All the things that make up our life, and that's not saying that everything we do is evil. The things that distract us from spiritual faith in God uh, are detestable in the sight of God. And they can be good things. That's the thing. That's a, you know, it's it and it is the reason we have to rely on Jesus to take care of our sins. Because we're even sinful with good things. We can love appropriate and good things so much that we exclude God. So we have to be careful. Very strict. Going on to the book of Mark. Mark 12, 43, 44. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. So they were watching, they were in the temple, they were watching a widow. And I believe she gave two coins or maybe one, but for, for all these other people gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. In Mark 4.19, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. We trick ourselves when we, when we pour our value into money, into finances. And the desire for other things entering and choke the word. This is the, the parable of the seeds. Choke the word of God and it becomes unfruitful. Luke chapter 18, verse 25. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because they have, when they hurt, when a wealthy person hurts, they have the resource to comfort themselves. And when you can comfort yourself, you know what I really need? I need a trip to Europe. I'm feeling bad about things. I think I'll go to Europe. Boy, I enjoyed Europe. Well, most likely, you didn't take that trip to Europe and, and spend it praying to God because you were able to comfort yourself. You did not need to turn to God and comfort yourself. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. And so let's look here at the royal law and what it is. And then I think that's, we'll just stop right here. Uh, we've got three verses in today. That's not too bad. He's talking about the royal law. So James, come uh, re, back to James. He says, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. So people in relationships are more valuable than money. 
So going back, the, the, what is called the royal law is found in Leviticus 19, verse 8. And so we'll, we'll look at that, and then we'll, we'll stop here. Uh, back, back to the book of Leviticus, verse, chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I, I am the Lord, for I am the Lord. As long as God is God, don't take vengeance. Don't try to fix, get people back. That's my job. I know their heart. Uh, don't bear a grudge against the sons of your people. That is um, people of faith for us uh, Christians. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Value them as you value yourself because I am God. So, any questions or comments about this? Something to contemplate. What is it that is worth a lot to you? Would you, if you could have a closer relationship with God, how much of your finances would that be worth? I just, I can't help but keep asking that question because that, boy, that, that, that sticks any of us. That sticks any of us. That would stick me. I'd say I want to have, I want to be closer to God and keep my money. How about that? Um, but think about this. Think about this. Blessed are the poor. Um, and think about what it means for us as individuals, what it means for us as a church um, as we progress through. Any questions or comments? Let's say a prayer and be dismissed.